Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Prepared for Environmental Change webinar series hosted by the Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute. My name is Steve Chybowski, and I'm the Resilience Cohort Coordinator at ERI. We would like to acknowledge and to honor the Miyamiyaki, Lenape, Potawatomiq, and Sawanwa people as past, present, and future caretakers of the lands on which Indiana University Bloomington is located. These ancestral indigenous homelands and resources are the current home of the Environmental Resilience Institute. We encourage everyone to engage with contemporary communities to learn the histories of this land, to look at who has and does not have access to its resources, and to examine your own place, abilities, and obligations within this process of reparative work. Our webinar today will focus on integrating green infrastructure into storm management plans to effectively manage stormwater and reduce runoff. All webinar attendees are muted. Please enter your questions into the chat function, which you can access by hovering your mouse over the Zoom window. In the last few minutes of the webinar, we will share a feedback survey through a Zoom poll, and we'd greatly appreciate uh, your responses and feedback on today's session. We are also recording today's webinar, and we'll be sharing a link to this recording along with follow-up resources with all registrants early next week so you can share what you've learned with your colleagues. And now, I am very pleased to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Gabe Filippelli, the Executive Director of IU's Environmental Resilience Institute. Thank you, Steve, and welcome, everybody. Uh, looking forward to this topic, particularly. This is an area of great interest for me as well. As Steve mentioned, I'm a professor of Earth Sciences at, uh, at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and the Executive Director of the Environmental Resilience Institute. To the point of this particular webinar, Urban Green Stormwater Management, you know, uh, stormwater is a huge challenge uh, with climate change and with our current infrastructure systems that we have built in in a lot of communities. And many of them are simply not resilient to, to stormwater and stormwater runoff impacts, which include, of course, pollution and, and flooding. Green infrastructure, as opposed to gray infrastructure, has been proposed and applied as a viable way to help manage the, the resilience and, and improve the city's and town's ability to, uh, to deal largely with, with climate change impacts. And it also costs a far less than normal gray infrastructure. So we're really excited to have Jack Eskin from the Delta Institute discuss the city of Gary's green infrastructure plan and our, our very own, or formerly our own Sam Hamlin, Samantha Hamlin from now the University of Nebraska Lincoln is going to give an overview of green infrastructure and its benefits regarding stormwater management. Go to the next slide, please, Steve. So the webinar series is coordinated by uh, Indiana University's Environmental Resilience Institute. I believe maybe that was the last slide, but that's all right. In addition to our webinar series, ERI has many resources available to local governments and the, and the general public. Uh, one, one resource I want to make sure you all know about is Indiana Environmental Reporter, which is an independent reporting organization supported by the Media School at IU and the Environmental Resilience Institute. The mission of IER is to present Indiana residents with factual information about climate change, as well as some strategies for citizens to prepare for, adapt to, and respond to the impacts of climate change. The next slide, please. I'd also like to alert you that our upcoming webinar shall focus on reducing community climate vulnerability and increasing resilience using community-specific policies. This is right in the wheelhouse of Environmental Resilience Institute, uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. We encourage you to share uh, this with uh, friends and colleagues. Next slide, please. Another resource I want to mention is, uh, is the Sustainable Development Code website, which has numerous resources for local governments working on environmental issues. It's organized by category, uh, and the website contains good, better, and best practice suggestions for removing code barriers, creating incentives, and filling regulatory gaps. Specifically, Chapter 1.2 focuses on strategies for integrating low-impact development, uh, such as rain gardens, green roofs, and other projects into stormwater management plans are directly in line with our webinar today. Next slide, please. We want to thank uh, the Association of Indiana Mayors, AIM and the Association of Indiana Counties, ACE, Health by Design, and the Indiana Public Health Association for continuing to support this webinar series. And the next slide, please. So uh, 
Joining us today are these. These are the people who registered for today's uh, webinar. They're um, from a number of sectors. A lot of students, uh, including some of my students. Shout out to you guys, uh, uh, and as well as uh, folks who are trying to manage stormwater impacts in their own communities. So, we hope to encourage your friends and colleagues to watch a recording of this webinar if they can't join, uh, as we record all of these and make them available at uh, eri.iu.edu. Uh, next slide, please. So our presenters today are, uh, are Sam Hamlin. She's uh, currently a postdoctoral research associate in the School of Natural Resources at University of Nebraska Lincoln. She's trained as an environmental geographer uh, and she brings issues of scale and sense of place into her research on environmental planning. Currently studying the sociological ramifications of vegetation transition in the Great Plains, she has a background investigating how green infrastructure and nature-based solutions can be used in rural and urban communities to improve resilience to socio-ecological problems such as climate change, flooding, and drought. Our, uh, our second speaker is Jack El El Eskin, sorry, who leads and manages projects in Delta Institute's green infrastructure and brownfields portfolios. With over nine years of professional urban planning experience, Jack has focused heavily on improving environmental quality and advancing economic development in the communities where he's worked. Prior to joining Delta uh, Institute, Jack served as a deputy director of redevelopment for the city of Gary and as a regional planner at the Northwestern Indiana Regional Planning Commission. Jack holds a master's degree in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, for all of you attending, uh, you're welcome to ask questions uh, via the chat function. Uh, so go ahead and, and, um, and dump those in and we will get to them as we can toward the very end. So with that said, I would like to welcome our first speaker who will be Dr. Samantha Hamlin. Sam, go ahead and take it away. Unmute myself. So thank you very much, Gabe. Um, I am going to take over the screen sharing now, and I'm going to swap my views, and I'm going to share it. Okay, so has this shared properly, I hope? Yes, it has, perfect. Okay, thank you. So yes, as Gabe said, um, I'm, here just to kind of lay some groundwork, you know, give everyone some background and context on this issue. And, you know, kind of talk a little bit about what is green infrastructure, like why does it matter, um, and what are some applications or resources. And why it matters, as Gabe alluded to, one of those reasons is flooding. Um, I think we all know that flooding is a problem in Indiana, a fairly major problem, as it is in many other places. And it's not really getting better. Um, just earlier this year, we had severe storms that caused flash flooding in a lot of municipalities, including Bloomington, where I was living at the time. Um, and you know, someone, when we had the flash floods in Bloomington, we did have a death from this. Um, so, you know, the, the flooding is a major issue that is not expected to get any better. With climate change in Indiana, one of the biggest impacts is precipitation, an increase in precipitation, which has been gradually happening and is expected to continue. Um, the big piece of this is that it's not just more precipitation, it's that it's falling more as rain than as snow. Snow, you get the slow snow melt into the hydrological system so it doesn't overload it. But when you get rain, you don't have that natural storage and it's hitting the system all at once. So, <clears throat> you know, this is something that's only going to be getting worse. 
And one of the reasons for this is combined sewer systems and CSO events. So on, you know, I'll kind of walk through this a little bit. A lot of cities have combined sewer systems. Combined just meaning that the sewer and the storm water mix. Um, once you get underground, like you can see here, uh, the pipe just takes it all to the wastewater treatment plant um, and that's it, which is great. Um, but they were, they were designed so that if you have a heavy rainfall event, um, you, know, you have overflow into the river. So you have all of the sewage and storm water. It gets sent right into the river because you just have too much rain. You also see it often backing up the storm drains. You've just overfilled the, the pipes has nowhere else to go. And as you can imagine, having storm water and sewage going directly in to your streams and rivers, not so good. And there's actually a name for this, urban stream syndrome. And it's not just the flooding in those heavy events that's uh, problematic. It's even in just a regular rainfall. In an urban environment, you have all the roads and the parking lots and the buildings. You have all of those impervious surfaces. And so the rain is just washing over those, um, picking up anything that is there, and it's going into the stream. So with urban stream syndrome, you see that flashier hydrology that can lead to flash floods you see more contaminants and more nutrients in the water. You can, you can see here, we've got a kind of eroded, unstable stream bank. You have less biodiversity. Um, and if you're a student at Manual High School in Indianapolis, you also see a sign telling you that sewage pollution is problematic enough that you should stay out of the water, whether it's raining or not. So we have all of these issues with storm water. So where does green infrastructure come in? <clears throat> well, as I was showing you, we have those pipes that were designed to handle this, but they sometimes, um, they sometimes fail. They're not able to keep up with the precipitation. So green infrastructure is one way of intervening in this. And I use a fairly broad definition of green infrastructure. It's networks of urban spaces managed for their benefits. And it can be gardens, it can be street trees, it can be parks, and it can be green stormwater infrastructure, such as bioswales, or rain gardens, or riparian corridors. And what they all have in common, as you can see, you know, they're vegetated. So the idea is they're holding rainwater in place, which gives it time to slowly infiltrate. And so the, the hydrological system isn't overloaded. The water just slowly infiltrates and um, you know, moves into the system that way, rather than flashing into you know, the storm system. So that all sounds really good, but what else can it do? And it's nice, Gabe already hit on a couple of these things, um, but regulatory requirements. So I was a little coy here. Um, when I say regulatory, I'm of course talking about the Clean Water Act, which does not require green infrastructure. It does um, require clean water and so green infrastructure is one way to meet those, um, those standards. And the EPA has a lot of support for communities wanting to implement green infrastructure. As, um, as Gabe mentioned, you get benefits beyond the stormwater management. If you plant a garden for food, you also get a place where the community can gather. You have 
you know, some stormwater management, you have pollinator habitat. It's often less costly. And an important piece of this is that it's an iterative management solution as opposed to that, that gray infrastructure of pipes and storm drains. And so more specifically, to give you an example of what I mean by that, um, you know, more and more cities um, are either completely separating those combined sewer systems, so they have a sewer system and a stormwater system, or they're enlarging the pipe um, and drastically increasing the capacity. And this is happening in Indianapolis right now with the Dig Indy Tunnel. Huge system to store and move water during those heavy events, as you can see here. Um, it's a $2 billion project that will take about 15 years to do. And while they've of course designed this you know, with, you know, to, with some future capacity in mind, with climate change and increasing development, which means more impervious surfaces, their course is going to be a threshold that this reaches where it will no longer be able to keep up with the amount of water coming into the system. And as you can see, it's gonna be really difficult to go in and enlarge that pipe to meet the capacity. But if we can keep some of the rainwater from ever getting into the pipe, then we can extend the timeline of that project. And so maybe we put in bioswales instead of a concrete median. Um, here in Indy, the Pacers practice building, they put in a green roof. So it captures stormwater. It also keeps the building cooler. And again, you can see you've got some pollinator habitat. And as Gabe mentioned, um, so maybe you plant, plant a rain garden, which is a simple solution to stormwater pollution. Um, and so this is another way to keep just a little bit of that stormwater um, out of the system. You can plant a small rain garden. You can do a larger rain garden slash bioswale. I'd call this a combo. And so with the, the benefit that you know, people living in the area, they have, these, they have more aesthetics, um, they have some wildlife habitat, and you can be iterating this throughout the city. You can put in more tree planters on the sidewalk. You can put little bump outs um, on, you know, in neighborhoods. You can be taking out some grass and putting in some native plants. So you can iteratively be removing, you know, just a little bit of that rainwater from the tunnel system. So this is one of the biggest advantages to a green infrastructure program. Um, and so a lot of cities, even as they build those, you know, deep tunnels or big pipes, they can currently implement a green infrastructure program. You can also use green infrastructure as one approach to improve environmental justice and equity. And this is um, just a specific project that um, our team is working on, looking at the you know, um, urban forest and equity within a city. But you can see a nice example here in Detroit. Typically you see in neighborhoods that are wider and richer, they have more amenities like trees and parks. And there's been a lot of research showing that um, you know, they have more tree canopy as, as illustrated very clearly here. But in any neighborhood, if you had a lot of trees and they were all ash trees, you know that you know, there's more than just quantity to be considered. But there hasn't been a lot of research on the quality of those street trees. Like, are they diverse? And so we are doing some research to see Right now we're doing it in Indianapolis to see if there's a relationship between the, the quality of the urban forest and race. And the reason this is important 
um, for equity, you know, that's an input that can go into strategic planning on, you know, for targeting areas that need more tree plantings, that need more diverse tree plantings. So this is a, another iterative way of addressing the issue of equity. And the reason we're able to do this analysis is because we've spent a couple of years developing the Indiana Green City Mapper, which if you just Google Mapper, um, you, will, you will find it. So we've collected inventories of different types of green infrastructure in addition to a fair amount of social and climate data so that the public or planners or anyone can go and they can look at different types of green infrastructure um, and compare it to things like where does this match up with the floodplain or where are there heat islands? So this is open to everyone um, and the project is continuing to collect data and hoping to improve it. So any municipalities that are here, if you're not already part of it, um, would definitely like to get you involved. So this is available for everyone and I am almost out of time. So I wanna thank you. Um, I, this was a collaborative project with our entire team, as well as, and I should have mentioned organizations and municipalities that shared their data, making it, allowing us to make it public. So thank you very much. And now I'm handing it over to Jack. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Go from the beginning. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Jack Eskin. Um, I am a programs lead at Delta Institute. Um, and I'm excited uh, to sort of share um, what was for me a labor of love for three years, uh, uh, the development of the Gary Green infrastructure tool and plan um, that I oversaw both in my time uh, as deputy director of redevelopment for the city of Gary, um, as well as uh, uh, through my work as a project manager uh, at Delta Institute. Um, I, as mentioned prior to joining Delta, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, environmental issues and the sort of synergy with economic development, uh, specifically in Northwest Indiana, uh, a place where sort of industry um, and environmental assets coexist side by side. Um, and seeing the attendee list today, I see that we've got a lot of folks uh, from Lake Porter and LaPorte County, um, you know, where a lot of these uh, sort of similar issues are right uh, in the backyard. And so uh, I'm excited to sort of talk about, um, you know, the approach that we took in Gary um, and definitely some of the uh, solutions or, uh, you know, uh, consistent themes uh, that can be brought to other jurisdictions and geographies, many of them um, sort of touching upon the themes uh, that Samantha uh, just touched upon um, in her presentation. Um, quick thing about Delta Institute, we're an environmental nonprofit. Uh, we work with communities, municipalities, public agencies throughout the Midwest. Um, and our areas of work sort of run the gamut from green infrastructure to regenerative agriculture to brownfield redevelopment. I'm an urban planner by background. And so much of my work centers around working with sewer districts, redevelopment commissions, different public agencies on um, development of projects um, and carrying out of different projects that achieve their environmental goals. I'll give a quick run through uh, in the compressed time frame of this project um, uh, and uh, you know how we scoped it out, everything that it includes, uh, and there will be opportunity to go into greater depth uh, in the Q&A and certainly I'm available for follow-up afterwards. But this was uh, effectively a partnership uh, with a, a diverse group of organizations um, and agencies focused on different things. Um, it really sort of melded together the focus 
of the Gary Redevelopment Commission on uh, taking the city's vacant land um, and, and thinking about what are beneficial ways for repurposing of vacant land, understanding that in the city of Gary, uh, nearly two fifths of the land area stood as vacant land and stands as vacant land. But also, um, you know, the, the Gary Sanitary District and Stormwater Management District, um, you know, how uh, that land can be repurposed uh, to address um, combined sewer overflow issues, um, uh, issues around neighborhood flooding and riverine flooding. Um, and and uh, these two uh, agencies brought on Delta, uh, one of our uh, common partners, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, um, and uh, uh, basically GIS modeling uh, outfit out of Detroit Dynamo Metrics to sort of capture what the opportunity was for integrating green infrastructure as an environmental solution into the city's long range planning and land management. So I, as I briefly touched upon, and you know, there are consistent themes even from uh, the prior presentation, but within the city of Gary, you had a number of existing problems that in their own way sort of enter into the question of green infrastructure potentially as a solution that touches upon um, many of these issues. The city is under a consent decree with US EPA to address its combined sewer overflows. Um, uh, as a, uh, a community that um, is heavily urban with lots of impervious surfaces and uh, really sort of dense clay soils um, for much of the city uh, that have sort of poor levels of infiltration, you get lots of neighborhood flooding as well as overbank flooding from the Little Calumet River, uh, which uh, is one of the main riparian corridors uh, that runs through South Cook County um, and Lake uh, Porter, um, and I believe LaPorte County um, uh, in Northwest Indiana, and is, is a huge source of overbank flooding. Um, I believe actually even um, IU Northwest back in 2008, there are these pretty vivid images of um, its campus and its parking lot just completely inundated with one of the um, you know, worst flooding events uh, with the local Calumet River in recent history. Um, as I mentioned, vacant land and blight is a very big issue in the city of Gary and how you not only uh, improve aesthetics along corridors, but how you repurpose land to create more sort of sustainable, uh, better quality of life within uh, the community. But as many of you know, um, with uh, Northwest Indiana holding uh, the nation's uh, newest national park, there is a lot of uh, unrecognized natural assets within Northwest Indiana in general, but certainly within the city of Gary. Um, you know, land adjacent to the Indiana Dunes National Park, um, a lot of it sort of holding the same valuable uh, plant uh, and ecosystem features, but um, not protected. So what are the opportunities to sort of identify and protect that land so it is preserved as a natural asset. As an industrial city uh, where you've got uh, you know, lots of heavy industry sitting right next to globally rare ecosystems, there's also need for identifying um, strategies that help sort of achieve that balance between those very contrasting land uses. And in a similar way, um, a lot of the most viable substantial economic development opportunities appear to be in areas that were uh, rich in wetlands. And so the city was um, really interested in finding opportunities that allowed for economic development to sort of continue forward, but um, stood in better balance with, you know, uh, protecting and, and restoring and supporting wetland features in the area. Um, and this is, you know, an issue that proliferates across the country, understanding that many of our cities were built before uh, the execution of the Clean Water Act. And so you almost have to sort of back into, um, you know, a more sustainable envelope of development um, when, you know, you have uh, cities that paved over wetlands, um, you know, before wetlands were protected. Uh, with all the abandoned land, um, you know, what part of it is thinking about what you do to sort of repurpose abandoned parks and schools uh, so they're still uh, beneficial and supportive for the communities that are um, 
uh, in the area, and all these issues are related to environmental justice. And so, you know, thinking about them comprehensively and what different solutions are um, to support environmental justice communities that are contending with a number of these issues. Green infrastructure isn't the silver bullet uh, that addresses uh, all these different issues, but it is um, a strategy that touches upon many, many, many different topics that are germane to the city. So what we did was we developed a project uh, to help the city plan, fund, regulate, and manage green infrastructure with the express goals of reducing blight, improving aesthetics, expanding and enhancing conservation land, reducing urban and riverine flooding, improving water quality, uh, balancing the different land uses that exist in the city, and as a result, improving public health. Um, we developed a plan that uh, had this sort of express scope of developing an online open source mapping tool, uh, which I'll go into briefly, identifying a sort of framework map for different types of green infrastructure that match the land uses uh, across different parts of the city, developing some model codes based on best practices from other cities uh, that can help uh, use the zoning um, and permitting process to encourage stormwater management and on-site conservation as part of redevelopment projects. Um, and we developed kind of a draft capital improvement project list where um, green infrastructure could be incorporated into park upgrades, into road reconstruction projects, stuff like that. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, similar to Samantha, we took a integrated approach to green infrastructure. Um, green infrastructure tends to be described in two different ways. One is that sort of regional network of forests and natural assets uh, that really sort of creates this, um, uh, you know, regional asset for conservation and, and recreation. But it's also a way to describe um, sort of planned infrastructure improvements that are intended to mimic natural processes around stormwater management. And that's where you start to see some of the more, um, you know, built techniques that you find on streets and properties like rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs. One of the challenging things we found is a stormwater director is going to have a specific uh, definition for what green infrastructure is. And then, you know, uh, say the US Forest Service might have a very different uh, definition as well. And what is a way in which we can sort of bring all these together with the idea that ecosystem services is the overall goal and supporting quality of life and quality of habitat, as well as managing urban flooding, these two things can be you know, satisfied under the umbrella approach to green infrastructure. So that's what we took. It leads to a more complicated project, but um, you know, that's almost what you need to do when you're looking for a comprehensive solution. So we embarked on a pretty sizable uh, stakeholder engagement over the course of um, really uh, two years. We um, held a mapping workshop, conducted stakeholder interviews, held three public meetings. Um, we uh, did surveys, uh, keypad polling, and all of it was meant to sort of uh, gather professional stakeholder feedback as well as local community feedback around um, you know, what, what the needs were from different environmental uh, uh, economic organizations, um, you know, local area nonprofits, but also what the local community wanted to see within their area. Um, and the first stage of this was to develop uh, an online mapping tool. So with 40% of the city's land vacant, you know, the question is what, what, are, what are the different types of green infrastructure that fit the uses within those particular areas, um, given what is not only uh, held currently by the city, uh, but also what land um, is abandoned, but potentially could be acquired through tax sale or other um, means. So the idea was to sort of identify different available land throughout the city and identify based on GIS data um, what, what areas would be best for stormwater management, what areas would be, would be best for conservation, beautification. We created different indices effectively for these different frameworks uh, focus, focused on these different areas. Um, and the output of that 
we're mapping tools uh, that sort of married together site readiness factors um, with external factors related to, in the, in the case of conservation, availability of uh, nature preserves and areas identified as restoration, areas identified as restoration priority areas uh, for stormwater management. Um, we ended up sort of marrying together information on pervious surfaces, soil drainage, residential flood reports with uh, available land. Um, and for beautification, we basically uh, identified areas where there was a lot of population density, density of business licenses, uh, but also uh, you know, a deficit of public green space and what would be the opportunities for creating stormwater pocket, pocket parks and things of that nature. Uh, so the tool is available along with many other comprehensive planning tools that we developed at the city of Gary, uh, this hyperlink here, and I can post that in the chat after uh, the presentation, but um, you know, uh, it's definitely being used as a tool for ongoing long range planning in the city. Um, and, and we think it could be you know, uh, a model that could be followed in other jurisdictions as well. Um, what followed that were a series of framework maps, uh, zoning guidelines, and a project list of you know, future capital improvement projects that really sort of laid out um, ways in which the city could use its land use policy, its um, you know, regulatory processes, and its ability to fund different projects to achieve its stormwater management goals through green infrastructure. Um, this uh, is an instance of the, or this is an example of the citywide framework map where we basically identified different types of green infrastructure that could be applied, um, you know, in different parts of the city. We've broken it down by different layers that you see here, but this is the map where it's married all together. Um, and it's, it's basically intended to show that uh, the a technique that you're going to apply uh, is going to vary in different parts of the city. Um, and I can go into a little bit more detail during the Q&A around this, but um, you know, the, the whole purpose of this is to uh, uh, really underscore that green infrastructure is not a one size fits all um, scenario in certain parts of the city. It means conservation in certain parts of the city. It means um, you know, converting vacant lots that were residential property into neighborhood rain gardens. And um, you know, a map like this is really intended to sort of break down different zones um, where GI fits uh, a particular land use policy choice. We also developed uh, guidelines uh, to update the city's zoning code and development permitting guidelines to meet stormwater management and conservation goals uh, for new redevelopment projects. As part of that, we identified through data analysis a stormwater impact area um, where uh, you know you uh, had particularly pressing flooding issues related to riverine flooding and uh, um, urban flooding that were a product of our, our data mapping tool, and we basically created this guideline that was informed by. Um, uh, language from other uh, cities and how they had approached uh, this problem where, um, you know, for a citywide standard, you're managing the first inch of rainfall, but within this impact area where um, uh, you uh, have particularly pressing flooding issues, you're managing the first inch and a half of rainfall uh, to meet um, the stormwater management goals. Similarly, using a lot of the existing information from prior plans like the Gary Greenlink plan, we had identified a conservation impact area where you've got a high level of chance that you're going to find, you know, uh, really um, uh, valuable um, native uh, uh, plant life, uh, you know, that is sort of consistent with what you'd find in the Indiana Dunes uh, National Park area and opportunities to sort of conserve that as part of a redevelopment project should be um, uh, uh, prioritized within the code. Um, and we approach this basically through establishment of vegetated buffers for different um, types of land uses uh, based on um, you know, suggested guidance for 
um, you know, evaluating natural assets on site. A good example of this um, is this site uh, near the Gary Airport, where you have uh, just to the north, um, uh, Indiana Department of Natural Resources owned property, Clark and Pine Nature Preserve, um, that uh, is one of the best examples of globally rare uh, dune and swale. Um, and just to the south of it, you have a brownfield site. And this northern area of the site basically um, comprises much of that dune and swale feature uh, that is to the it, that it is part of the state owned property to the north, but it's privately owned property. The city acquired it through tax sale. You know, there's a priority because it's close to the Gary Airport for doing, you know, economic development related to logistics for say, but what are opportunities for um, including in the, the development guidelines for the site, preservation of wetland assets while also allowing for redevelopment to occur on the brownfield piece of the site. So uh, effectively this code guidance um, is there to support um, that sort of activity. Um, and there's a lot more information on that within the plan. Lastly, uh, we developed a project list of over 100 uh, potential capital improvement projects focused on sidewalks, vacant lots, inactive and active parks, um, and even you know, different opportunities for phytoremediating brownfields through things like hybrid poplar farms. We mapped it throughout the city. Um, and you know, what I can say is since the authoring of this plan, um, there have been a handful of them uh, that um, have uh, either uh, been implemented or uh, at least reached the concept stage. And I feel like, you know, for delivery of projects like this, that is like one of the best reasons to do a planning project is um, it makes your project much, much more marketable uh, for uh, state and federal grants because you've gone through that empirical uh, exercise of we should do this versus anything else because X, Y, Z, um, and here's the scope of it. An example of a project um, that, uh, you know, is, is pretty consistent with many of uh, the ones uh, that you'd find in that uh, prospective capital improvement plan. Um, it hasn't been implemented, but is a good example of how uh, a planned infrastructure upgrade can sort of include green infrastructure to meet its goals. Um, a stretch of Airport Road in Gary, um, which uh, is uh, slated for various stages of reconstruction, um, and some of it has actually even already occurred. Um, uh, but, you know, it's just to the south of state-owned um, uh, protected wetlands, and it's an area where um, you have uh, lots of routine flooding and with the airport just to the south, there's even like infrastructure resiliency um, questions and issues related to it. Uh, we scoped out um, the impact of just doing bioswales on nearly three miles worth of, of roadway to sort of manage over a million gallons um, and, and not only support uh, the, the reconstruction project that had happened on the roadway uh, because all this flooding obviously impacts existing gray infrastructure, but you know, help support balance between a major piece of infrastructure to the south um, in the Gary Airport, uh, as well as a natural asset to the north. Um, you know, the, establishing that balance um, is one of the best things that green infrastructure can deliver, particularly in cities um, where you really have not only diverse economies, um, you know, but you also have diverse land uses and, and what are the ways in which you establish balance between those diverse land uses. Um, so I can go into a little bit more detail during the Q&A, but that's a very fast and furious run through the Gary Green Infrastructure Plan and Mapping Tool. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Sam. Uh, if you could unshare the screen, that'd be great. We'll just all see each other. Uh, phenomenal. Uh, I love that. It was a great one-two punch of, you know, the, the, the principles, theories, and designs of, of green infrastructure by Sam and then Jack, the application of said in a very detailed way. And I like your, um, uh, 
one size does not fit all kind of approach. Uh, and that's really informative, I think, for folks to understand. Uh, and certainly, I, 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 it was eye-opening for me as well. I, I want to lead off with one question, and then there's going to, and then I'll start playing off some of the questions in the chat, which are starting to come in already. Um, and, I, and I'm going to ask this to each of you guys in succession. So, Sam, I'll start with you. It's going to be the same question. In your context, what are some of the barriers to understanding the value and function of green infrastructure that you that you know about, you've read about, or you faced yourself? So, Sam, what are some of the barriers to understanding the value and function? And you're muted up, so. Yes, yeah, so I'm not just talking to myself. Um, I have done a fair amount of that research. And um, on the planning side, it's the uncertainty about how it will function. Will it actually do you know, what, what we think it will do? And the, I saw a question come in on the chat. Um, there's a big question about maintenance. Um, for I know working in Portland, which has a huge green infrastructure program, maintenance is always an issue. And who actually maintains those? Um, they've put a plan in place. I would not call it streamlined by any means, and I don't think they would either. And interestingly, one of the biggest barriers that I've, I've seen in interviewing people is just the uncertainty of climate change. And we don't know, you know, we've run the models, we think we know what might happen. We, you know, we have estimates, we have a range, but we're just really not sure. So, you know, do we really trust doing rain gardens to, you know, to actually meet the requirements. On residents side, um, there needs to be a lot more education because, uh, you know, a lot of times a bioswale just gets plopped in front of their house or a little curb bump out and they have no idea what it is. So people go in, they mow them, they replant them, they park in them because um, they have no idea what it is. But once there's some outreach and education, and I mean beyond sending a postcard in the mail, once people know what they are, um, in a lot of my research, um, some people start to take ownership of it. Like, oh, so maybe my basement won't flood so often. Um, and yes, it is okay to plant native wildflowers in some of those fixtures. So I would say those are the, the biggest barriers that I've encountered. Great, thanks, Sam. And, and, and for you, Jack, uh, the barriers to understanding the value and function of green infrastructure. And then particularly, there's another question that I'd like to play off of what Sam says, maintenance. How do you deal with maintenance of some of these, um, these systems? You know, I, I think that um, there is a need to sort of understand that on a more comprehensive level. Um, you know, what the, the work that I've seen most municipalities or agencies um, uh, address the question of maintenance through is on a project by project basis, um, which is certainly one way to do it. But, um, you know, it's reflective of the fact that it's still kind of viewed as, and this is one of the biggest, you know, challenges for green infrastructure, ultimately, um, it's, it's still kind of viewed as a boutique sustainability technique versus um, really part of the business of usual uh, work that public works departments and stormwater departments should be embarking on. Um, and so there's a level of customization to each of these projects that makes it hard to sort of scale them um, uh, you know, at the level that needs to occur to meet sort of the resiliency goals um, uh, amongst everything else. And so, um, you know, what I can say in some of the work that uh, we've been um, doing uh, as part of the Resilient uh, Infrastructure Sustainable Communities Initiative, and I can share information on that, is developing toolkits and guides uh, around um, topics like green infrastructure design, 
uh, monitoring. There's a planned one on, on maintenance and life cycle costs. Um, you know, and these sort of tools, while it doesn't sort of replace what, what needs to be done around maintenance on a project by project basis, it starts to build that body of familiarity um, around what you should plan for as part of maintenance during the design phase and the planning phase and how to sort of operationalize that. Um, in, in the projects that I've been able to work on, uh, like the physical green infrastructure implementation projects, many of them in Northwest Indiana, in places like Michigan City and Hobart, um, you know, always as part of the, of the uh, engineering process and the, and the build process, you end up with a maintenance plan, uh, but it, it always feels like it's very sort of attached to the, the custom build element of what that rain garden is or what that bioswale is versus um, understanding, uh, you know, the maintenance needs um, of a particular green infrastructure site, um, as well as, you know, the, the routine replacement needs for, you know, um, a sewer main. Um, and I think that green infrastructure for it to successfully scale, um, you know, the, the, the maintenance and, and management needs of it um, should eventually come as second nature as more of the, the gray, gray infrastructure uh, maintenance um, components. I'll also second Sam's, Sam's point around monitoring. Um, the topic of uh, monitoring, particularly in communities where you don't already have like that strong built-in function, it's, um, it's a huge area of growth for the area. Like in terms of like, how do you evaluate um, performance? Is the, is the installation doing what it's supposed to be doing? How do you collect and manage data around that? How do you interpret it? Um, you know, and I, I think that uh, to really understand beyond just the modeling stage um, is, is GI meeting its performance goals that's that's something that um, is you know a particular area of growth um, as part of this implementation of work. Great, thank you, uh, Jack and and Sam. Uh, some very um, rich content in the chat right now that's coming through, um, and I'm going to actually ask. Uh, uh, you know, Mark has a very important question. Is you know uh, the aesthetics? Uh, we actually, I took my students out to uh, one uh, one yesterday. You know and. And they said that the aesthetics could have been, you know, they were lacking a bit. Um, and, you know, that is a, a certainly a value to, to some people. And that's really important. Um, I would love to hear. So, Reggie, would you mind coming off mute and talk, if you can, and talk a little bit more about this general permit and permitting requirements in this and, and your okay. training efforts? Okay. Um, I'm Reggie Korthos. I, um, was a, I, I was a retired 12-year uh, veteran at IDEM. I ran the MS4 Stormwater Program. Now I'm the executive director of the Indiana MS4 Partnership, which is a non-membership organization, but made up of all of the 185 permitted entities under the Stormwater Program in Indiana. So what we do is we work with IDEM and the new general administrative permits will be issued in December. Our annual meeting is October the 26th and, and it's at the Indianapolis Marriott Hotel. So anybody can go online and join it. But what we did in the work group as we developed the new parameters for a general permit, moving from a permit by rule to a general administrative permit is looking at what EPA was asking to expand. And two of those areas were illicit discharge, uh, doing more monitoring of outfalls, particularly if they go into uh, waters of the US that are on the 303D list. But then the development of post-construction standards that include uh, mandatory green infrastructure, uh, implemented. We have some communities that all that have already written this into their ordinance. Uh, the town of Maryville is one of them. And so what we'll be looking at at the annual meeting um, is how those ordinances can be structured so that municipalities can can more easily require 
these, these practices when they are doing plan reviews and plan approvals. Um, there's a new um, guidance document out by Purdue University's LTAP program and Christopher Burke, and they put together um, an ordinance that would allow municipalities to easily um, add green infrastructure planning. But as we look ahead and what the MS4 partnership is doing is taking the MS4 annual meeting and making it more of a training event so that when these particular requirements um, are mandated through federal regulation, we have to be able to teach the communities how to do this. And if you can't do the teaching, you can't do the enforcement. And so what we need to look at is how we train and green infrastructure is going to be a big part of it. What type of programs? Some of you may be familiar with a gentleman that worked for US EPA Region 5 um, and has retired, Bob Newport. He started a program that was like a workforce development program. And basically it was training young people to do the work of green infrastructure maintenance so that when a municipality puts the practice in or when um, they require it, they require it in their, um, their ordinance, they can recommend to the contractor uh, or developer that this is a group that um, would be able to help you over the long term. Well, unfortunately, Bob um, got sick. He's kind of, um, he's out in Arizona now. So what I'm doing through my work at IU Northwest and their CURE program is we're gonna look at some federal dollars for environmental education and set up a program where we could train students to develop um, this type of, you know, job descriptions so that we can have and, and make recommendations to communities. So I'm just starting that, but I'm excited about it. Um, and I'm excited about how we're able to share the information at the annual meeting. Item will be a big part of this. And um, it's a good place for municipalities, for contractors, for elected officials to see where this permit is going and, and how we're gonna move down that line. Great, thank you so much, uh, Reggie, for that, that clarification, the added content, that's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll notice that, um, that our, well, one of our uh, team members at ERI has dropped her, uh, her address. Uh, she'd like to hear a little bit more about that uh, offline, okay. Reggie. Now, uh, in the final, well, final minute, really, or so, Jack, as a practitioner, any response to that, to this training, training emphasis that, uh, that they're putting in? And you, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, that that's all awesome, uh, great things to hear, Reggie. Um, and it really sort of underscores that, um, you know, it's not just regulation uh, that helps drive this, but uh, the support of capacity building that comes with that, I, I completely agree. Uh, if you're going to require it, um, you know, education uh, is, a, is a main component for ensuring that you actually get um, you know, the, the capacity building that's needed to sort of deliver that um, from a programmatic standpoint. Um, and, you know, workforce development um, really is a piece that, uh, I mean, it, it can be uh, folded in um, throughout numerous public policy goals. Um, you know, of course, this one as well. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of all things that Bob Newport has done. Um, and so, uh, it's great to hear that uh, his work around workforce development um, is, uh, you know, uh, influencing, um, you know, how uh, the state of Indiana is uh, approaching um, uh, how to do capacity building and linking it up with workforce development for green infrastructure. Um, these are the very sort of tactical things that need to be put in place um, to really sort of uh, standardize green infrastructure, as I mentioned, uh, in a way where it's not a boutique sustainability item that nonprofits and, and policy groups talk about, but it's something that public works directors just know how to do as well as a road resurfacing project.
Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you both, Sam, Jack. It's been so informative. I really appreciate it. And the audience's attention and engagement has been phenomenal. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Steve again to, to wrap us up. Yeah, so first, I also want to thank our speakers, uh, Sam and Jack. Thank you very much for your presentations today. And I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this call. Uh, before you hop off, we are going to launch a quick poll uh, just to gather some feedback from everybody um, on, on uh, your thoughts on the presentation and whatnot and help us, uh, uh, help us with our planning of future presentations. So if you could just go ahead and fill out that poll um, before you hop off the call, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we thank you and we hope everybody has a great Wednesday. <laughs>